All right, so this is my third year, I believe, that I've gotten to speak at the Mecca Banquet. And so as a person who was on the periphery, the beginning of specialty medicine as it was delivered to the public for really the very first time in the early 1990s, it was our hospital in Denver, Colorado that came up with this idea of actually having a thank you banquet for general practitioners who make the possibility of specialty medicine something that we could even consider. And so uh, it's nice to see 20 years later that people are still giving thanks to the referring veterinarian because without you, Mecca really would not be able to exist as it exists. And the constant challenge for a specialty emergency clinic is how do I make myself an extension of the family practice in such a way that the clients benefit and you, the general practitioner, also benefit? And so those uh, specialists like Marla who are able to strike that balance between excellent medicine and being a partner with the referring veterinarian have successful practices. Those that don't often find themselves at odd with the general practitioner and really with the public at large. And so when I was asked to speak this third time, uh, Marla said, Sean, will you speak about the economy? And I thought about that a little bit, and I thought, well, the economy is kind of a thing in flux, if you will. If you still live in Chicago, or like, I live in Chicago, so if you live in Chicago, the economy isn't really that great still. But if you live in Austin, Texas, or you live in Washington, D.C., or you live in Southern California, or you live in Seattle, or you live in Kansas City, believe it or not, other places around the country, the economy is actually getting a little bit better. And I thought, what was a common thing that I could talk about that regardless of the economy would be applicable to all of your businesses? And it struck me to talk about how it is that you have to matriculate from mom and pop to professionally managed businesses. I want to challenge you tonight to look at your own practice. I think that as a profession, and I'm paid to be confrontational, I'm, Marla didn't ask me to do these things, she, I'm just telling her what she's getting paid for now, or what she's paying me for now. Um, I'm paid to be a bit confrontational, I think. I'm paid to challenge you a bit, I'm paid to educate you, and I think I'm paid to push you outside of your comfort zone. So take what I have to say, not necessarily with a grain of salt, but take it for that. Somebody who's attempting to push the envelope a little bit, but most of what I'm talking about I feel like is grounded in a heavy dose of reality for three reasons. One, 17 years of management experience in veterinary hospitals. Two, uh, this year I joined the ranks of practice owners. I bought my very first veterinary practice in Kansas City, Missouri. And so I, uh, and for our very first month of operations, we had three blizzard closed days. It was fantastic. <laughs> so my, so I'm, I'm in the red my very first month. It's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> But the third reason is, is that you've all kind of come up with me in the last 20 years, those of you that I know from way back, and some of you look very familiar to me. And I think that we are all a little bit guilty of being myopic, that we tend to look at only our own practice and forget to see what's happening out there. And let me remind you what's happening out there. 35% of all veterinary practices are profitable to the point that they would be attractive to anybody else to buy. 65% of veterinary practices make no to low profit. And not only do you all celebrate that, but you get offended if I point it out. The average veterinarian gives away $67,700 worth of business per year, but complains to high hell that they can't make any money. The average veterinary employee says that I'm not a place where people hear me. I don't work at a place where people hear me. But the other side of that is the average veterinary employee hates to be redirected. In fact, in my opinion, hates to be managed. And when we manage you, you cry. Metaphorically or literally. <laughs> and I'm not even talking about just technicians and client service representatives. I'm talking about people with VMD or DVM behind their name. And the crying may not be literal gnashing of teeth, but it's meltdowns, it's tantrums. We are still a profession that, by the by, is run by the threat of emotional outburst in the milieu on a regular basis. So only the strong survive. And strong in this case means people who have enough willpower to overcome any kind of insistence that they do the job the way that it's supposed to be done. Now, it should come as no surprise to you that there's absolutely zero, and I've looked all over the world, there are zero business schools with a veterinarian's name on them. 
Yet there are thousands of business schools with another smart person's name on them. Yet you are the intellectual 1%. You really are. You're amongst the brightest of the brightest, the smartest of the smartest. I've said this for 20 years. One of the things that attracted me to this profession was I found that uh, most of my life I thought that I was smarter than most people that I met, and I think that was true. <laughs> Sorry, most people. <laughs> But the truth is, when I and I'd worked with human MDs, psychiatrists, and felt challenged by those people. But until I started working with veterinarians, I never really felt insecure in, sometimes, in some ways about my own intellect. So impressed by the brilliance that the profession seems to draw. But have you heard the term idiot savant? <laughs> because I think with that great brilliance also comes a bit of hubris that is mirrored in humility. Aw, oh, shucks, I'm just a veterinarian. Aw, oh, the real rules don't really apply to me because I'm just here to be a member of the community. So adverse to conflict is our profession that we would rather give services away than have a conversation with the client about why we should charge you for what we do. So adverse to conflict are we that we would rather raise somebody up from the bottom of our barrel, if you will, and turn them into the practice manager simply for the reason that they survived us the longest, even though they're not really skilled enough to do the job. <laughs> so we're so bad at conflict and managing the dynamics of business that have been proven to us as things that we have to manage that we're yet one of the surviving professions that still has to answer the question, what am I exactly paying for to the client? Hotels seem to have gotten this right. Restaurants seem to have gotten this right. Automobile makers seem to have gotten this right. Even institutions of higher learning have gotten this correct. Everybody out there that's a successful business has figured out that we must base our product on what the market will pay for our product. We are in a class now of people in America that are segmented by socioeconomics. Oh, everybody wants what you have, but not everybody can afford it. And so we're still being run by what I would call old school paradigms. I like people, I like animals, I want to live where I want to live. And I'll set up a veterinary practice. And if I have to make everybody else around me charge a little bit lower, well, I won't mind because I get to live where I get to live. And so we have a profession now, again, coming full circle, the why of this lecture. We have a profession that only 35% of practices are routinely profitable, creating a situation where nobody wants to buy veterinary practices that's a junior veterinarian, creating a secondary situation where corporate America will soon own and run this profession if you don't do something about it today. And so there are some things that you can do. And it's called professionally manage your practice so that you can set yourself up to have at least five choices when it comes time to exit instead of one choice, which is call whoever is willing to pay for this practice right now.